Listen, while you were sleeping, the Minnesota Vikings decided they were going to pull an all-nighter, and they made agreements on multiple contracts. They signed quarterback Sam Darnold just after midnight. Well, agreed to terms. They'll sign those contracts on Wednesday. And then in the morning, Green Bay Packers running back Aaron Jones. They also signed a kicker from the XFL, but that's a little bit less profile. What does this mean? What does this mean for the future? What does this mean for now? And how is this going to impact things moving forward? Welcome to the Real Forno Show. Welcome to the Real Forno Show. Hosted by Tyler Fornis, the managing editor of USA Today's Vikings Wire. Writer for the College Football Network. Publisher of Substack Run in Shooter. Host of the good, the bad, and the hungry on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, as well as a founding member of Vikings First and Skull. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another special episode of The Real Forno Show. I'm your host, Tyler Fortis. With me, as always, is producer Dave. And we are here to talk about more free agent signings as Odie just curls up in the bed right next to me. Cheddar is off with the wife uh, going on a nice long walk at the park. And we are here to talk more Minnesota Vikings football. Dave, there's a lot of commotion yesterday surrounding the Kirk Cousins news. He is going to the Atlanta Falcons and the Vikings needed to figure out something at the quarterback position. And they did. They br- are bringing in Sam Darnold on a one-year deal worth a max value of 10 million. We don't know structure yet. And this is going to be the big thing with all these free agent moves. Until you see structure, do not panic about total money. That up to $10 million could be big playtime incentives. He could have a base of like four or 5 million. And then if he plays like three games, he barely makes 6 million. So those things matter. So don't panic. And they, then they also signed Aaron Jones and those contract details just came out. And we'll talk about those in a little bit and a kicker. Uh, And let's just, let's just be real. The Vikings are finding ways to utilize free agency properly, filling holes. They're doing a pretty good job of it. Hey, Asaf, welcome to the show. And yes, we are early, earlier than our normal time, but I'm glad you're here. It is another great day. Mm -hmm. I wake up this morning and my phone had blown up and I'm like, what the heck? And it looks, we grabbed Sam Darnold, and I'm like, hmm, there's our bridge quarterback. And then, of course, we hear about Aaron Jones as well. Obviously, Quasey was cooking last night, and he had some pretty good results because we get these two guys and then pick up a kicker for competition. And like I've told people a million times, kickers are a dime a dozen. You can find them, you know, just about anywhere. So I'm glad we have that spot filled at the moment. Hopefully there's competition in camp when it comes to that. But we're going to see. I think the Vikings Vikings are making some exciting moves over the last 24 hours that should have all fans excited. Absolutely. And listen, Sam Darnold, <laughs> this is going to be a very interesting conversation surrounding Sam Darnold. I don't think he's good. I also don't think he's bad. He is in this really weird middle ground at quarterback. Now, let's kind of back up. He played three years at USC, came out as a redshirt sophomore, and was the third overall pick for the New York Jets. They traded three second-round picks to go up and get him. It did not work in New York. He spent three years there. Then they traded him to the Panthers for second, fourth, and sixth round picks. And the one memory that most Vikings fans will have of Sam Darnold is that game against the Carolina Panthers in 2021. They uh, Darnold drove them down at the end of the game and tied it up. I think it was like a fourth and 18 or something that he converted. And then Kirk Cousins hit KJ Osborne on a corner route. And that ended up winning the game for the Minnesota Vikings. I think the score was 34-28. Darnold has flashes of brilliance. He has flashes of, wow, this guy's really good. Mel Kuyper Jr. was vocal about Sam Darnold was, 
I, I think his third highest graded quarterback ever. And the only two guys that graded higher were John Elway and Andrew Luck. I think I'm getting that right. He would always talk about him in the same light as those two, which I always found wild because when I watched his film at USC, I was not impressed. I thought he had flashes of brilliance, but there were so many inconsistencies, kind of panicky in the pocket. A lot of that stuff manifested in the same way at the NFL level, but he can make some wild throws. He can create out of structure and the general mold of what you want in today's quarterbacks with those types of skills, Darnold fits, but he's also, there's a reason he's going to be on his fourth team since 2018. He has not lived up to the billing. He, there were discussions about him seeing ghosts because he blatantly said it. And I think Mike's picked it up by NFL films that he sees ghosts out there when he's trying to read coverages. But I think he's improved a lot since that quote, which I believe was 2019 with the New York Jets, his second season. I thought that had to do with him getting mono that year and the fever he was under. Had. That may be, that I don't was, remember that. That he was seeing things. Yeah. There, there's a real chance that you're right. I just don't remember that being the case. So we'll kind of leave that in an ambiguous state just because like we think it might be, but we don't know. So take but that for what it's quarterbacks worth. that see ghosts when, uh, they get the pass rush, the big guys coming after them and they're wondering. So that does happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And he flashes these just dynamite throws. If you go search, uh, Twitter, you can search like Sam Darnold dime or Sam Darnold dot. You can find a bunch of great stuff. Or if you just go to uh perpy NFL on Twitter, good old Forrester, he's got a bunch of them because he he just ran with the idea back after the Niners uh, lost the Super Bowl and just had fun with it. And look, he ended up manifesting Sam Darnold to the Minnesota Vikings. Good for him. But there are flashes where it's like, man, this guy could be really good, but he's not. And he's a bridge guy. I think he's a good bridge guy. I also think having him as a bridge guy is important in a different way, Dave. He's got a connection with Josh McCown. I think that matters. McCown was in the building for his first start in 2018. They were both with the New York Jets. And not only do you have that connection, Darnold is going to understand what it's like to be a top pick. And he's going to be able to relay some of his experiences dealing with the media, dealing with the pressure, dealing with the day-to-day -day life in the NFL, and be able to help out a young player. And Lone Wolf mentions in the chat, He's only 26 years old. This dude is the same age as Hendon Hooker. Yeah, he's the same age as Hendon Hooker. Wild. We were talking about Hendon Hooker all last draft process. So this is a talented football player that's never really been able to put it together. Everybody remember in school where you had that kid who just had this sky high potential. Everybody thought the world of what he could be. And then he ended up doing something stupid and kept getting suspended or ended up like getting like a, like a couple of minor consumption tickets. And then just never really fulfilled what people thought he could be. Like everybody knows that kid from their high school where for whatever reason, they just never reached their potential. That's Sam Darnold in, in a general construct, in a general, in like a vacuum. He never reached his potential. Now, Dave, could he reach his potential considering this will be the best infrastructure he's ever had, the best group of weapons he's ever had, arguably the best offensive line he's ever had. Does that mean we could help him reach that potential? I'd say there's a small chance. I'd say if anybody's going to get the most out of Darnold, it'll be the Minnesota Vikings. Does that mean, Dave, that Sam Darnold will be good? I, I don't think we can go that far. Good is a very general term that everybody uses in a, in a different sense on a scale of one to 10 with 10 being Patrick Mahomes and one being like Christian ponder and Spurgeon win. I'd say you're looking at between a four and a six where he's going to peak at like average Kirk cousins, maybe a little bit better than that, but he's going to have some pretty big lows. And I, I think that's, that's what a bridge quarterback is. You're not going to get a guy who you want to start 
all 17 games. Your best case scenario is he plays like Case Keenum in 2017. Case Keenum had a impeccable year, but he wasn't great. The team was great. Keenum was good enough considering everything he had around him. And I think that would be the best case scenario for Sam Darnold. And this is not me picking the Vikings to go to the NFC championship game. But we're, we're just talking about the quarterback play. I think if you got case Keenum level quarterback play, you're in a great spot. I agree. And I think if he, if the Vikings get the most out of him, that'll be fantastic. Right. Mm -hmm. You hope sort of that happens, but I still think it is all part of the plan that he is the bridge guy while whoever we draft and it's, Obvious, 100% now, they're going to draft somebody high this season. They're going to go after that quarterback, and he's going to mentor that guy, like you said, and teach him out what to expect, and there's a huge difference between the New York press and the Minnesota press. So he's going to go, let me tell you stories, young man. Um, But that he's going to be able to handle that well, I think he's mentally focused that he knows he's coming in, not as the starter, that he's the bridge guy, and that's going to be his mm-hmm. job. And if we can maximize him out, he could turn into a long-term backup for relatively mm-hmm. cheap money if it all works out. If he moves on next year to the next team, that's fine. That means our rookie quarterback is Stepped up is the guy, and we feel we don't need him, and we'll keep, you know, the low-dollar guys. But I think even up to 10 is a relatively low-dollar figure that would be fine for a backup. And he does have moments where he's just brilliant, you know, that he can obviously get the job done. It's all the rest of the time. He needs to, you know, minimize that. Sort of like Nick Mullins, but not as exciting as Nick Mullins. But, hey, Mm -hmm. it is what it is. So I think it's a good signing. I I was pleased. Very, very pleased. And let's let's talk more about kind of the infrastructure. Any quarterback that comes into the Minnesota Vikings is coming into an infrastructure that is arguably the best in the NFL to nurture a quarterback. The only one that I think would be better is Kansas City. And here's why I say Kansas City. Andy Reid, Travis Kelsey, Patrick Mahomes. Even if that guy never starts for Kansas City. What one comparison I will always make, and there are now two. Peak Brett Favre, they kept churning out backup quarterbacks and trading them. Mark Brunel, Doug Peterson, Ty Detmer, and the big one, Matt Hasselbeck. They kept churning out guys and trading them. And those guys ended up starting a lot of football games. Then the Patriots. They kept drafting guys to replace Tom Brady. Jimmy Garoppolo, second round pick, traded for a second. Jacoby Brissett, third round pick, traded for Philip Dorsett, a wide receiver. Like They kept drafting guys and then flipping them because Brady just kept going and going and going. So maybe that's something that the Chiefs should start looking at doing, where you draft young quarterbacks, develop them, and then you can flip them for picks. But the Vikings have a great infrastructure. You have Jefferson, you have Addison, when he's healthy, Hawkinson. And this year, a rookie's going to have Aaron Jones, Christian Derrissaw, and Brian O'Neill as bookend tackles. And I think Ed Ingram's turning into a very good guard. I think he's this will be a breakout year for him in 2024. I think Bradbury's fine at center and fine is a very relative term. So don't, don't freak out about it. And you get a good left guard. You're cooking, you're cooking with gas. You're cooking with charcoal, propane, everything. So I, I think you're in a really good spot to continue to develop Hostways in the comments mentioning, well, what happens to Dobbs and Mullins Dobbs? I don't think resigns and that's not an indoctrination of him. It's just sometimes there's just not room. And I think Dobbs deserves an opportunity to really compete and be a guy, be a high-end backup in this league, but it's just not going to be in Minnesota. And 
I wish him all the best in the world. Mullins will stay because his cap hits 2.23 million. If you cut him, you save almost $2 million. But why would you cut him? Keep him. It's $375,000 in dead cap if you cut him. But he's a good football player. Keep him. Keep him on the, the roster. He's cheap. Jaron Hall might be the one to go. Let's just be honest here. He might be the guy you slide onto the practice squad and still keep around because you want to keep developing him. But there's a chance Mullins gets traded too. The Vikings traded for him. That's a very tradable contract because it's like no money. And you get a quality, as far as strictly backup quarterbacks, I don't think Mullins is ever a starter in this league, so I consider him just a backup. Darnold, I view in the same bucket. So if you only look at backup quarterbacks, you could argue Nick Mullins is a top five backup quarterback in the NFL. Backups are good. Backups are hard to find. Jameis Winston just got 8 million. Jacoby Brissett is probably going to start all year for the Patriots. Just got $8 million. Backup quarterbacks are getting expensive. So you get like a fringe top five to fringe top five backup in Nick Mullins for 1.895 million. You jump on that. That sounds great to me. And I think that's why the Vikings will end up keeping him. But to kind of wrap it up with Darnold, I think he's a good football player. But sorry, he's a he's a good talent, but he's never really been a good football player in the NFL. I think that's the best way to frame it. The ability is there. Just hasn't been able to piece it all together. Will he at some point? Yeah, I really think he will. That time is not now. It could be in 2024. We'll find out. But there is at least there are at least things to like about what Darnold could be. But I don't think you can count on him to get there. If he does, it's a huge benefit for your franchise. Mm -hmm. And looking at his dive into the stats, he was improving in San Francisco. So Mm -hmm. who knows? I think he's going to be good. Scott asks, why didn't the Vikings try to trade for Baker Mayfield? I don't think they wanted Baker as their starter. I think the plan. They couldn't trade for him. Baker's contract had expired and he signed before the legal tampering period opened. The Vikings had no chance to get Baker. But so I, I think the plan all along, though, is not to bring in another starter. I think it's to go after that draft, that rookie quarterback. I can tell you, Dave, I heard from multiple sources, and then it came out after the fact when Baker signed. The Vikings' backup plan was Baker Mayfield. Hmm. So if Kirk wasn't coming back, their idea was to go after Baker. I don't know what that contract would have looked like, but that was the idea. Baker got a hell of a deal with uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Two years, most of it guaranteed. And then a fourth year that's a little inflated, but $40 million for quarterback in three years where the salary cap's probably going to be like $310 million, maybe more. That's pretty palatable. So good for him. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, It absolutely good for him and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So let, let's bridge the gap here uh, before we kind of get into Aaron Jones. I also want to point this out. Just about 20 minutes ago, we got a Facebook account. Go like our page, Vikings First in Skull. We're going to be doing a lot of stuff on the Facebook page, and uh, we're going to be posting all kinds of stuff. It'll be a good place to, um, to have more of these uh, comment threads that you guys like to do in uh, uh, during the live shows you'll be able to do that there as well and i'll I'll be posting a a lot of my work from vikings wire so it's yeah a one-stop shop for you guys find plus you'll know when we're going live there just like you would if you like subscribe and ring the bell vikings first and skull just search it on your facebook page it was just created we don't have the graphics up yet but they're coming Yeah, I literally created it 20 minutes ago. It's pretty cool. Uh, But as you know, I am am not the brains behind the scenes. I am uh, the beautiful hair in front of the camera. (laughs) So I don't have, I'm not the technical wizard as far as the images and stuff. Dave is going to get the images and then we're going to have a lot of fun on the page and you guys will enjoy it. Now, let's talk about the kicker. John 
Parker Romo. He was a kicker for the, the San Antonio Brahmas. If you don't know what a Brahma is, it's a bull. And the, uh, <laughs> they were with bull. the XFL. Yeah. Uh, if you've ever seen the rock, they call them the Brahma bull. He's got that longhorn tattoo right here. Like all that aside, he was a pretty good kicker for the Brahmas in 2023. Now you have to look at things contextually. They don't kick extra points in the XFL. Now the UFL and you're not allowed to kick touchbacks. So you have to kick it between the 20 and the goal line. And they, they wanted to emphasize the kick return, but they also made it safer by bringing everybody to the 35 yard line and all the blockers at the 30. So you have like, you're actually like keeping it safer. There were no injuries on kickoffs last year in the XFL. If you can believe it or not, no injuries, pretty impressive considering when, what happens when you look at the NFL feels like there's one injury on a kickoff every single time you remove a lot of force impact. Remember guys like Travis Jervy, the old special teamer for the green Bay Packers, Steve Tasker, Bill Bates, guys who just throw their bodies like cannonballs at blockers. And you'd have the wedge of five guys basically linked together. You don't have that anymore in the NFL. So they're actually having talks about making it safer, but you have to contextualize some of the data that you're getting from these other leagues. Cause all you're looking at is field goals. John Parker Romo was good at field goals, 17 of 19 in the 10 games that he played for the Brahmas and two of three from 50 plus he did. I believe it was, he won a kicking competition where he kicked a 64 yarder to win it. He's got a good leg. He played at Virginia tech. He's been in a couple NFL training camps. I think it was Chicago and Detroit. So there is a little bit. I also don't think that signing him precludes you from getting another kicker. I think bringing in competition is a good thing. I don't think you're going to bring in three kickers, but you're probably going to bring in one more and let them duke it out. Because what's the difference between bringing in a kicker who could end up really making your roster or your 11th or 12th wide receiver. Who's not going to make it. Right. That's what we're talking about here. So I think you're going to see the Vikings sign one more kicker and hopefully Dave, that they figure out the position, but 17 of 19 field goals. That is, we're talking about 88%. That's I good. think that's, that's around the right number. That is pretty good. I will take that all day. And Timothy you give me an said, 88% kicker. There's a video out there of him kicking a 73 yard field goal. Thank you, Timothy. We'll have All to right. Up. I like that. I like that a lot, but he's probably never kicking a 73 yarder in the NFL game. Just, just so we're clear because you have to kick that ball so low that it's easily blocked. And that's why a lot of times those long field goals don't end up making it because you have to, you have to kick it with such a low trajectory, but let's move on to the signing that got everybody all oogly googly this morning, the signing that Dave got to wake up to. And that is Aaron Jones of the green Bay Packers. Now contract details came out. So he initially signed a four year, $48 million contract right before I believe Dalvin cook signed his big deal which was five for 63. And they had asked him to take a pay cut because this was going to be the final year of that deal. And they wanted to kind of make things work and they have cap issues. So, all right, makes some sense. They maneuvered some money last year where they fully guaranteed the whole salary and he took a pay cut. Okay. Well, I can't remember what his, his actual um, salary was. I think it was $11 million with 1 million in, in incentives. They asked him to take a pay cut to $4 million and 2 million in incentives. He comes to Minnesota and gets a base of 6 million with 1 million incentives. So he's going to make the max he would have made in green Bay, no matter what, with the chance to make more by going across the border in Minnesota. That's big because he could have just stayed in green Bay. The fan base loves him. All the media members were like, just not Minnesota. Like we're hurting today. I got a buddy, Jack, who's probably not going to watch this, but happy birthday, buddy. We got Aaron Jones from you. I, I hope you enjoy your day. And I, I, I say that like a snide little bastard, but I mean that Jack's one of my favorite people. He's a great guy, but 
and he was not happy when I when that news came out that Aaron Jones was talking to the Vikings. He thought that would just be catastrophic. Like that's how much the fan base loves this player. He all accounts is that he's just a genuine human being, and the talent is incredible. He had some injury issues last year, but he led the NFL in rushing from week 15 on. I think it was 628 yards. He was sixth, sorry, seventh in PFF rushing grade this past year and sixth in yards after contact per carry. This guy's 29 years old and he's still playing at an extremely high level. So it doesn't feel like you're getting somebody who's washed. You feel like you're still getting somebody who's at the top of his game. Maybe not like the tippy tippy top, but like 90%. I'll take that. It's a one-year deal, so you're not committing to him for multiple seasons. You're, and you know what? If things go well, you bring him back, and you keep having those discussions. Maybe you sign him to a two-year deal, but give him a big money at, at the front, and then keep a, uh, have something where it's super incentive-laden in year two because you're going to expect that fall off because, look, he's a running back. It just kind of happens with these guys because they get battered and bruised more than any position in the national football league. That's why the fall off is as big as it is. But Aaron Jones is the prototypical running back for what you want and what the Vikings want to do. He can run wide zone. He can run inside zone and mid zone. He can do um, gap concepts like pin pull tosses, GT counter, all those things that, that you see in the national football league. He can run them all. Plus he's a legit, really good receiver. You're not talking about a guy who says, oh, he can catch a screen pass. No, he's a receiver, and you can do a lot of fun things with him because of that. I'm a huge fan of this signing, Dave. And when you look at other backs getting really big money, look, I would have paid Saquon Barkley. But Barkley got almost $13 million a year. I think it was 12.75 is what the official total was. And then Derrick Henry just got two for 20. Uh, Josh Jacobs got four for 48, which I don't, I think only like the first year of that is guaranteed. So they can get out of that. Like guys were getting big money. Deandre Swift got three years, $24.5 million. Deandre Swift. Deandre Swift isn't very good. The Vikings made him look great, but they also had like my wife in the a gaps blocking or trying to, trying to penetrate in, in the run game. Like that's not fair. You can't be doing those kind of things and expect great results if you're the Minnesota Vikings. So Swift was looked good by default, not because I think Swift is really good. The idea of him is good, but he's never been able to translate. He's in a, on a similar depth to Sam Darnold, where the idea of him is awesome, but it's just never really translated on any form of consistent level. There's a reason why the Lions traded him and a reason why the Eagles didn't want him back. So I'm fine that he's in, in Chicago, but you're getting a value for a really good football player. And Quasi at Ofomensa is cooking. And we talked a lot and I've been mostly positive on him. There are flaws. And I think the people who only highlight the flaws are too negative. And I think that's unfair because we're in, we're going into year three. He finally has the cap space to really be able to shape the roster. However he wants how this works is how we should be judged. Yeah, it sucks that the 2022 draft class really hasn't produced anything. Ed Ingram's the best pick, and he's like, you can debate how good of a starter he actually is in the NFL, but you haven't gotten much from Booth. You've gotten nothing from Lewis Seen. You've gotten almost nothing from Asamoa. Ty Chandler's been meh. Like, th there are real concerns here that this class might not really produce much of anything. So it's. It's a, a lot of different concepts here where when it comes to Quasito Fomenza, you have to give him time to truly build this out the way he wants. Now, if these moves all bomb and this next draft class looks like it's not going to give you anything and 2023 doesn't develop the way you think it should. Yeah. Then we can have the real conversation that he should go, but you have to give general managers time. You have to give head coaches time to really implement all the changes that they made. It's not like going into an office and you change like three systems and you can do that in the course of two months. It takes a lot of time to change cultures in the national football league to change a lot of different things. All right. 
You got to give him time. And I think right now, everything looks really promising. The, the trend is great. Now we have to see the results. And if they get that quarterback and that quarterback works, we could legitimately be talking about a Super Bowl team in 26, 27, or 28. Maybe 25. Like, that's a realistic outcome here if you hit on quarterback. Because look at the infrastructure that's in place right now. And the Vikings might not be done. Daniel Hunter might still be coming back. We have not heard any reports that he's not. And that most of the first wave of free agency is done. Hunter's still out there. What does that mean? Why hasn't he agreed to a deal yet? I'm, I'm starting to really wonder and ask questions of, hey, maybe he's coming back. We'll I'm see. The reason he's asking like $28 million. So, where, where are you hearing 28? I heard it this morning somewhere. But interesting. If, and he's pricing himself out, is what he's doing. But if he does come back, we have room for him. Even with the guys mm-hmm. we got yesterday, there's room for three edges. And that's cool. That would be mm-hmm. awesome. But if, it, if he's asking that much money, we're not going to pay that much money. And there's a lot of teams that are saying no as well. But the longer he stays out there, the more likely he may come back and say, all right, I'll 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 stick with the Minnesota deal. Because I'm sure they gave him numbers and said, hey, we'll have you back yeah. at this. And he goes, and then I'll retire a Viking. And we'd love to see that. So it's going to be interesting to see how it all works out. Now, you talk about the first wave. Free agency technically starts tomorrow right we're in the legal negotiation period of it right now and it's moving fast for this year and it seems to be moving faster than most normal years on how the nfl is doing it at least for the vikings i mean this is one of the most exciting free agency periods for the minnesota vikings i've seen in a long time i don't know if i Mm -hmm. can remember a better one but i mean there's some years that we didn't even play so this is a good deal. People should be excited. And if we get Daniil back, that's all the better. I'd love to see him back. Absolutely love to see him back. Um, we'll find out. Yeah, we're going to find out. We're going to find out really quick. Dave, this is such a fun time for the Minnesota Vikings. And I'm really really excited to kind of see how everything manifests let's answer a few questions from the chat before we go here today and i do want to remind everybody like and we hit a huge milestone this morning i don't think we've talked about it yet tomorrow is our one year anniversary as a channel and we just passed three thousand subscribers we would love to be able to get to 3100 by the end of the the day today so we can go in tomorrow and really be able to celebrate on all of our shows and we're so grateful that you guys have decided to choose us for our, uh, what do you call it? Um, your Minnesota Vikings news, because look, we're yeah, not news breakers. Yeah. But we, we analyze the sport and we, we try really hard to give you guys a great product. And we're, we're very grateful that you guys have chosen us. Last night's show was the best show we've ever done. As far as the numbers perspective, we got over 360 people watching live. And right now we're at 171. So we're very grateful. So thank you. Let's let's get a couple questions here, Dave. What do you see in the comments? Oh, well, Blowfish asks, what if the Panthers new coaching decides, new coaches decide to trade Bryce Young? Vikings were apparently high on him. I don't think that's going to happen. Do you? No. Um, so there's multiple ways to look at this. To my knowledge, the Vikings were not high on Bryce Young. So what uh, Blowfish is referring to is the Tom Pellicero report that came out after. And to me, that was PR spin. And if you ever follow any politics at all, spin happens all the time. Something happens, you want to spin it in a positive light for yourself. And you want to uh, control the narrative, essentially. The Vikings wanted Anthony Richardson. They were going to go all out for Anthony Richardson. But they said they wanted Bryce Young. Because, hey, they couldn't get Bryce Young. And it it kind of saves face a little bit. So I don't think they'll trade him. 
look, it was a mistake to draft him. I didn't think he was the best quarterback. I didn't think he was the second best. After I dove into the all 22 and everything for all of those quarterbacks last year, I settled on Bryce Young being number three. He has that moxie that, hey, I'm just a gamer and I'm going to win. But at the end of the day, he just doesn't have like that next level ability. He doesn't have that next level. Um, what do you call it? He has the moxie, but he doesn't have anything to really elevate uh, himself. He doesn't have like n- great arm strength. He's not a phenomenal athlete. He's a good athlete. And he's also 5'10", 195. So that all matters. And the whole staff wanted CJ Stroud. Ownership wanted Bryce Young. Uh, Bryce Young was not good. Staff got fired. And now you have a brand new staff again. So I don't think they'll do anything. I think what's going to end up happening is David Tepper, the owner, is just going to say, make it work. Make it work. Okay. We've got a next question. Josue asks, should we expect a JJ deal to get done soon? JJ being Justin Jefferson and not JJ McCarthy. I think there's a 95% chance that this deal gets done by the start of the season. I think there's probably about a 50 to 60% chance it gets done before the draft. And then after the draft, when that, when the news for that quarterback comes in, I think that you're going to have a much better sense of when it'll come. I think it's going to come no matter what. I don't think there's any way, shape or form. The Vikings don't get a deal done with Justin Jefferson. They were so close last year. It's not like you're in a position where the Vikings can't get one done or they don't want to get one done. Jefferson wants to get one done. You just have to figure out the nuance behind it. So I think it's coming, but we, I just don't know when. Got another one from Clay Walser. Are the Vikings being aggressive in free agency this year because they plan to move up and draft a quarterback and want to have the pieces in place, basically? So that, and you know, if that takes this year's first, next year's first, possibly the first after, that we have pieces in place and can succeed without those extra first round picks. That that's a a difficult and kind of intricate question. So let's break it down a little bit here. I think the Vikings are doing the making these moves in free agency because they just want to improve their football team. I don't think it necessarily has anything specific to do with the fact that they're going to go get a rookie quarterback. They want to win. And I think this people will make fun of it, but the idea of um, the competitive rebuild, it's just, uh, it, it's like a, if you, Dave, have you ever heard of a rhino, uh, which is Republican in name only? Like it's kind of the same concept. It's, like, I don't know what acronym, but it's just an in, in name only. The Vikings are trying to always win, but they're also trying to give themselves that flexibility and turn over the roster, which they've done. And I think the idea of the competitive rebuild just gets misunderstood by so many people that it, it kind of gets memed, but they're trying to get their team in a position to be competitive consistently. And I think that's what these moves are exemplifying. They're not signing a ton of one-year deals just so they can try and go and win it all right now. They're signing deals for decent length. Jonathan Gernard, four years. That's only the second four-year contract Kwesi Dopamensa has given out. That's something we haven't talked about a lot. Like Josh Oliver got a three-year deal, but it's essentially a two-year deal with an inflated third year. Zadarius Smith had a three-year deal, but it was an inflated third year. So it was essentially a two-year deal that they ended up trading. And Jonathan Gennard seems like a real four-year contract. So they're in a position where they can actually spend some money and make moves. And they have a ton of cap space in 25 and 26 to absorb because they don't have a ton of long-term commitments. They don't have these bad contracts. They're making the right moves to try and win long-term. And Aaron Jones, it, that's a one-year deal, but it's also a 29-year-old running back, so I understand that. I think they want to have a great infrastructure to set up for a rookie quarterback, but they also don't need to have one set up for a rookie quarterback. Like They're not just trying to put a few pieces together to make a rookie quarterback look good for one year. They are trying to set up for the long term, and I think they're doing a great job. We had a question from Anthony Tollison. 
What about getting Xavier Howard? The idea of Xavier Howard is good. I just think he's washed. And depending on the money, if you he's also, I think, 31 years old. He's had a lot of knee issues. If you want to give him two million bucks to come in and compete for a starting job, I'm fine with that. I don't want to commit a lot of money to him because I do think he's washed. I think yeah, cornerback can have a really short shelf life. He wasn't a fast guy to begin with, but he was so sticky in coverage where he just made up for it. Plus, he's really long. And if he's got anything left in the tank, give him a small deal and let Flores see what he can do to maximize him. But right now, I'd probably say I'm out. But it's an interesting idea. The last question we're going to take is from Thomas Fowler. Okay. Interior O or D line in round two. At this moment, D line. Because I think you're going to be able to get a good D lineman at 42. I don't know what uh, I, I think the Vikings will have. Like Blake Brandle signed for good backup money. It's not starter money. But it's really good backup money. And I think that's perfect for a sixth offensive lineman. He's your first guy off the bench. They cross trained him at center. You could theoretically play him in all five spots. Nine and a half million dollars over three years is awesome. Awesome. I concur wholeheartedly. I think the they'd go defense on that because you're going to want to get some. There's some good defensive players out there. Yeah. And you're going to want to stack them early because I'll it, say it this. drops off real quick yeah. after that. I'll say this. If they love an offensive lineman at, that they would they could be able to plug and play at left guard, I'm not against it. I'm against taking a tackle on day one or two because you, it's, it just doesn't make sense, especially with Brian O'Neill playing at such a high level and only being 29. Christian Darius, I was going into year four. He's 25. You have your bookend tackles for the next five years at least. And it kind of stinks because this tackle class is so absurdly good. But if you have a guy slide, let's say a Jordan Morgan who has some shorter arms for tackle, but he was a left tackle at Arizona. I think 62 or sorry, 32 and three quarter inch arms. It's a little too short, but a guard with his movement skills and size, I really like. So I think, I, I think it's a really good idea. It, everything's going to depend on how the board falls too. If Chop Robinson is there, I'm going to yell at everybody to take him. I would yell at everybody if the quarterbacks are all gone to take him at 11. He's my fourth overall player. I love Chop. But then you're going to have guys like Darius Robinson who could be there. Tavondre Sweat. I think that might be a little too high, but a great nose tackle. Yeah, it's it's going to be really hard to have a conversation where, hey, I don't value a nose tackle. Well, you need to value a nose tackle in this defense. I'm going to pull up my interior defensive line rankings just to make sure I don't miss anybody. I think Chris Jenkins could be interesting in a trade down scenario. Uh, I don't think Johnny Newton's going to be available, but for, for some reason he ends up falling. Yeah, I'm in Brandon Dorless. If he puts on more weight, cause he dropped like 20 pounds for the senior bowl. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're not a true edge rusher. You are a three technique that can pop outside. And I want to see him kind of bulk back up. But man, Anthony mentions Braden Fiske. I am not high on Braden Fiske like a lot of other people. I think there are real limitations there. But that get off is really good. I'd take him around three, maybe around four. But some of the talk about, hey, you should go high second round. I'm not there. I'm I'm not buying so much into the combine that it's going to be like a next level. So I think he's good, but I don't think he's great. I think they're a lot better guys right now. Fisky is eight on my defensive tackle rankings with a, a mid to early third round grade. Fig nuts just said this is one of the greatest or best off seasons. He can remember since signing Winfield senior buddy. I agree with you a hundred percent. And with that, if there is any news, if Quasi continues to cook today and anything, if anything pops up, we've already got a mm -hmm. lot of players that have agreed to contracts. And you know, tomorrow when it kicks off, the bunch of them are going to be at Egan to sign their contracts. And we're going to get 
uh, video conferences of all of that. It's going to be fun coming up here in the next few days. But if something new pops up, we'll be right there. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Anthony follows up. He take a flyer and uh, Fisky in round three late. Oh yeah, I'll take him there. I just think some of the round two discussions a little too rich for my taste. But if you want that kind of player that's just super quick off the ball and explosive like that, I get it. I understand. That'll do. Thank you guys very much for joining us. We maxed out at over 180 people at one o'clock on a Tuesday. God, this is the best time of year. And next week we have March Madness. But if anything breaks, we're going to be around. And at the very least, I will have a short up so you can get a, a real quick synopsis. And then as Dave works on the back end, we'll have a show for you ready to go. We'll be around. And don't forget all your all the written content you need coming from this, this free agency period, vikingswire.usadata.com. We're going to have it all for you. Until then, at the, ver- at the very worst, we will see you tomorrow night for a one-year anniversary show on The Real Forno Show. What day? We're going to see you before that. Because tomorrow afternoon at approximately 4 Central. Ah. We're having the NFC North. Who will be King Roundup Show? We're hosting this week. And it's going to be fun. Everybody's asking how the Lions, Bears, and Packers are doing. Hopefully miserably. But we're going to find out tomorrow. Join us at 4 for who will be king your nfc north roundup show it's going to be a blast the guys are fun to talk with and rib and banter back and forth but i still think the vikings are doing the best in the off season so far but we'll i see. do too yeah with with that what do we say skull vikings everybody skull vikings like subscribe and ring the bell to get notifications it helps us grow this community that we all love our minnesota vikings and on behalf of tyler fornis and myself dave stefano thank you so dearly for watching the real forno show skull everyone